We're fortunate today to have Jack Imhoff with us. And Jack has a fantastic background. He's been with the club since about 74 or 75. He's a biologist. He's an accomplished Aikido black belt. He's been with Trout Unlimited. And, um, and we're very fortunate to have him. If you get a chance to look at Jack's bio, which we have online, he is a Renaissance man, and we are fortunate to have him today to discuss conservation, something that we're going to look to our club to do now and in the future. So thank you very much, Jack, for joining us, and please take it away. So my, my topic is going to be investing in our present and future fishing and restoring and protecting our rivers. So uh, the overview is going to be talking a little bit about the key fisheries principles and concepts, the role of the watershed, which is one of my favorite topics, of course, uh, link between rivers and fish, and then managing fish and fisheries and what, what, what's happened over, happening over the last 20 years or so, and especially most recently, and why restoration and natural reproduction are going to be the key things that will bring our rivers back to health, um, not necessarily hatcheries per se. So... I just want to stress that we've been here before. Uh, for those that know me, you've probably seen this. This is one of my favorite cartoons. It's, uh, it's from the, uh, uh, the Carling uh, Conservation Digest from October 1947. And in the upper, upper uh, panel, you see Pine Creek in 1872. There's a little lad with a stringer of fish. The birds are singing, the squirrels are running around, the fish are jumping, the stream is tight and narrow and cool flowing. And now we see the same stream in 1947, and the old lad is the, is the grandfather. Now the young lad is the grandfather saying to his son, uh, grandson, when I was your age, William, a sparkling stream flowed here. What you see is the result of the destruction of the forests and the swamps. I'd like to say we never knew any better, but we do. We just keep on repeating the same friggin' mistakes every 20 to 30 years. And right now we're in that process of swinging back the pendulum about 40 years in our scientific and management knowledge. So that's a bit disturbing. But anyway, we do know better. So let's carry on. First of all, I want to stress what we've got with our rivers and streams. We've got amazing rivers, not just in Ontario, but right across Canada. I might want to stress to you that Southern Ontario streams, because of our geology, are some of the most productive by surface area of any streams in North America. They're as productive as some of our Montana streams and Wisconsin streams. They're extremely productive fish factories if the habitat and the water quality is good. So we have something special here. The only streams that I have found that are even more productive than Southern Ontario streams are a few of the streams on PEI. And for a couple of beer and about 50 bucks, I'll tell you which ones those are. <laughs> but anyway, we'll wait, we'll, we'll talk about those later. So we have a variety of uh, beautiful uh, looking streams from what I call small variable gradient streams, modest gradient, mostly riffles, pools, some little bit of cascade. We have medium type streams, uh, larger river systems that uh, large uh, pools and point bars and lovely runs. We have low gradient spring fed streams that uh, flow through the landscape, icy cold in some cases, and quite often some of the most productive streams that I've electrofished over the years. Uh, again, for a small fee, I'll let you know where they are. Uh, we also have very famous rivers uh, that we, a lot of us uh, have helped to develop, like the, the Upper Grand River. And the Southern Grand now is, is one of the most productive fisheries of anywhere in Southern Ontario based on wild fish. The Upper Grand, not so much. It's, uh, it's a tailwater fishery. But the Southern Grand and the migratory fish there, as well as the stream resident fish, are based on natural reproduction. We've done a good job in that watershed. We also have, as I mentioned, these incredible rivers with migratory fish. Um, a few people were up at Denny's Dam today and uh, know that the quality of that fishing. Uh, I, I keep on watching John Volk's uh, Facebook feeds and he's driving me crazy um, with all the, all, all the fish they've been catching uh, on, the, on the Saugeen. But we have beautiful rivers like the Maitland, uh, some sections of the Thames, the Saugeen. Uh, we've got special rivers, guys. Nottawasaga. Uh, the, uh, uh, a lot of other beautiful rivers that have high pro productivity. Of course, we have 
rivers that have other species as well, we have from smallmouth bass out to northern pike, muskellunge. We have a lot of things going for us in southern Ontario. And we have these beautiful rivers right across Canada that, that are that some are in very good shape, others not so much. So with all this wealth, why are fisheries failing? And we'll talk a little bit about that in the next few little, little while. First of all, I just want to talk about the things that I think about when I'm thinking about conservation and making sure that our rivers, lakes, and streams are as healthy as possible. Uh, these are some of the concepts that I use when I'm thinking about uh, restoration and protection. First of all, fish are not sized to their habitat. You can have a very tiny stream with very big fish. You can have a very big river with very tiny fish. So they're not sized to their habitat. Fish are highly mobile. We don't realize how mobile fish are until we start putting telemetry tags in them and started to, to monitor where they went. And as the tags became smaller and smaller, and we were able to put smaller and smaller tags into smaller and smaller species of fish, we discovered to our amazement that they traveled a hell of a lot. In some cases, not just one riffle or pool, some are traveling many kilometers, uh, tens of kilometers in the course of a season, looking for different types of habitat. The challenge there is that we have fragmented our rivers and streams horribly, so mostly through unintentionally, undersized culverts, perch culverts, um, ponds, dams, all sorts of things that have caused breaks in the, in the watersheds to prevent these fish from moving around. The other element is that fish in rivers have likely co-evolved to the pattern and dynamics of how rivers create form and structure. Rivers are dynamic uh, things. Uh, there's a field of science called <clears throat> fluvial geomorphology, which studies how rivers sculpt themselves, how they create their meanders, how they create ripples and pools and modify and change over time. It seems logical then if fish evolved over millions of years to systems that had a basic physics that created certain patterns that fish would evolve to exploit those patterns. So, so that's why I say that fish have evolved to use the dynamics of typical rivers that are healthy and stable. Uh, by the way, stable does not mean static. I'll, I'll talk about that in a few minutes. So habitat management protect, it includes protection and restoration. And it's the cheapest long-term solution to healthy fisheries, by far the cheapest. You put a little bit of money in to creating and maintaining healthy habitat, the animals do it themselves. I had one fellow say, but what about hatcheries? We've got to start stocking these fish. And I said, what did these fish do for the hundreds of thousands of years that they were in our rivers and streams before people came to stock, start stocking them? So we do need to think a little bit more naturally when it comes to how we manage our systems. And these are some of the key principles that we think about when we're looking at healthy rivers and healthy lakes and streams and ponds and such. And the fish populations are ultimately regulated by how much they can be produced, what the level of mortality, predation is, and how fast they grow. And one of the other elements in there is density dependency and so on and so forth. The fish populations also depends on the quality and quantity of habitat. One of the things we discovered early on when we were doing stream rehab and, and sad streams, we certainly could increase the number of fish in a, in a little section of stream by improving habitat. But in many cases, all we did was move fish out of really poor habitat that they were sitting in, into the much better habitat we found, that we created for them. And we didn't really improve the population until we started to cook, put habitat at, at the scale of many kilometers rather than one little riffle or one little pool. So habitat is really important. Then habitats need to be connected. Uh, a good colleague and friend of mine from uh, Colorado, Dr. Kurt Fausch, has done some landmark research on the movement patterns of fish in rivers, in small and large river systems, and how they move around many, many kilometers. Even um, uh, one of the lads, Chris Bunt, a number of years ago, did his, uh, was doing his PhD looking at uh, smallmouth bass movements in the Grand River, and uh, he was utilizing uh, the, um, the fish derby. Uh, to uh, capture and to help him capture fit on smallmouth bass and put telemetry tags so he can monitor their movement patterns over the course of a year or two. One of the bass that they tagged was released at Bingham and Park in Kitchener in the, uh, I think it was August of the one year. He finally tracked it down and found it in Air, Ontario the following year. If anybody knows the Grand, that means the fish had to move downstream from Kitchener over the Mannheim Weir all the way down to Paris, Ontario, hop over the dam there, hang a hard right uh, up the Nith River and then swim about uh, 25 kilometers up the Nith River so he could be caught in air. 
<laughs> carry off. So you think that fish move around a little bit. So the, these are things that we need to think about. And some of, and this is why, for example, Trout Unlimited has put a big effort on what they call Reconnect Canada, which is trying to figure out how to unfragment as much of the environment as possible. Also, fish species and their habitats are linked to the surrounding watersheds. I mean, when you think of it, the rivers and streams are the capillaries and arteries of, of the land. They drain everything that comes off and through the land into a common area so that, the, that the, river, the health of the river, the productivity of the river, the health of its habitat and fish is dependent upon the health of the land. And when we bugger up the land, we muck up the rivers. So we have to really not just focus on the rivers, but we have to look upslope as well and work with our friends and neighbors and the municipalities and the farm fields and so on to make sure that we're all husbanding as best as we can. And ultimately, there's no free lunch. There's no infinity to uh, the resource. There are limits to it. There's the maximum productivity. No matter what you, how hard you push something, you're not going to get anything more once it reaches the limits of capacity. So there are limits. And as you degrade systems, your limits are diminished. So uh, you really have to think about that. So when we think about rivers, we, we th I mean, most of us uh, are, you know, have a favorite riffle or pool or a, a certain section of river we like to fish, but what creates that structure that we're looking at? Well, it starts at the very broad landscape level because ultimately the landscape, the, the topography, the geology of the area, not provides the rock and the structure, so how it manages water. Over long periods of time, climate and, the, and its uh, consequent weathering patterns over centuries, even weeks, days, months, years, centuries, glaciation, weathers that rock grinds it down, creates soil structure and other materials that are then exploited over time by vegetation. And vegetation modifies then how much of that water moves over through the landscape because it uh, modifies it through the uh, water cycle. We can talk about that later if you want. The water cycle is how, them, how, how much water moves through, over and through the landscape or out through the plants. After that, over time, the valley then at the finer scale directs how much of that water that flows over and through the land and under the vegetation gets into the valley and creates the rivers, streams, wetlands, and so on that we're, we find interesting. And finally, at a local level, the site creates the channel form and provides the habitat and stability. So really, if you really want to understand that lovely stream that you like to fish, you should use Google Earth Go take a long stretch, a look back at the landscape, overlay the geology and topography to really understand why you have a river that looks the way it does, why it has the productivity it has, because it's the landscape that drives everything you see at the local level. So these are the things we have to think about when we're, we're managing land, when we're managing our rivers and streams, that it, it is um, the term hierarchy. It, it's a nested set of scales that drive into the local things that we understand. And, challenge we face as humans is that we're a visual animal and we have a tendency to scope our issues and problems but what, what we can see right in front of us when a lot of the issues we're dealing with with at a broader scale so we need to think about that and like 40 years ago no, 20 years ago we didn't have google earth we didn't have any of this stuff we had to use topo maps and, and aerial photos to try to understand what the heck you're looking at now with the click of a button you can have all sorts of resources to better understand your landscape it's pretty darn exciting. So geology to a large degree creates potential for how water moves over and through the landscape. And when it moves over through the landscape, it captures nutrients, other materials, sediment, and depending upon how healthy the landscape is, it contributes those to the local streams that, that flow through that landscape. So that also includes a relative productivity. Uh, our, I mentioned our rivers and streams are really productive, and that, the reason for that is we sit in an area that's to a large degree post-glaciation with a lot of sedimentary rock, and a lot of the sedimentary rock in this area is high in uh, calcium carbonate and other calcium and magnesium, which basically, when it dissolves, creates a fairly high pH of around 8.2 to 8.4, which is an order of magnitude more productive than acid-based water under, under with a pH less than 7. So it creates very productive waters as well. But the geology in general dictates how much water comes out, how hot it is, how cold it is, how much of it is contributed as groundwater. 
And years ago, when we started doing this work, we've done it both for the Grand and the Credit and other water courses now. We were able to identify which type of landscapes are likely to find what type of fish communities. Warm water, mixed, which was cold and, and warm, or cold water communities. And the, reason, and the cold water communities on the Grand are, are concentrated to a large degree through the middle part of the Grand, which used to be a huge glacial fluvial outwash area of the glacier. So huge amounts of gravels and sands and other materials move through that, create a large moraines, and those moraines are of gravels and sands are very porous, which means water goes into them more easily than it flows over top, which means it creates high water tables, which in the valleys come out as groundwater, which create cold water streams. So we can use geology to at least give us, to infer the potential for certain types of, uh, of uh, fish communities. How far that potential is realized is dictated at a finer scale by what happens in the valley. So it, there are different scales operating on this sort of stuff. Uh, sort of thinking of it poetically, the ri rivers are the children of their watershed and fish are ultimately the children of the, of the river. And ladies, anyway, so one, the key thing is that, uh, that the fish are ultimately controlled by what happens on the landscape. They only have limited control on what happens to them. So really that we need to make sure that we look after the watershed because if we don't, <laughs> the children will be in trouble. When it comes at a finer scale, one of the things we also, oh, I see what happens. Well, what we also find what happens is that people don't understand how rivers work. Uh, I think most of you, if you've heard a talk by me, if you've heard me use the term fluvial geomorphology. But uh, for those that don't, it's the study of, of the, well, geomorphology is the study of the interaction of water and or wind on, on land and, uh, and shorelines. So you'll have coastal geomorphologists that study a longshore drift along large water, bodies of water where you get um, movement of the materials. Fluvial geomorphologists study how water and sediment over time sculpts and changes the river form. So looking at the upper left-hand corner there, you think, okay, that's, you know, that's, that's base flow habitat. That's the limiting factor for the maximum productivity of fish. So people say, well, that's ultimately controlling the relative productivity of the stream. Well, not really. It's the, the flow in the lower right-hand corner, which is called the bankful or channel forming flow that sculpts the habitat that you see when the river drops to low flow. So if you don't have a healthy, stable, bankful channel cross-section, you're going to have really bad low flow cross-section habitat. So we really, whenever I'm doing restoration work, I'm designing my work to manage and to direct the flow for high flows to ultimately sculpt a channel that will, be, uh, that will form and we'll see when the river drops into a low flow chat and a low flow um, or low, low discharge, I should say. So that's why it's important to understand both of these types of flows. And why, why is that? It's the uh, ba bankful flow is the flow, the maximum flow prior to the river flowing into its floodplain. It's when it has the most energy and the most capability of moving water and sediment. And all rivers, healthy rivers, move sediment lots of sediment and that's how they dissipate their energy and they dissipate their energy not only by bouncing from side to side which increases their travel time and slows themselves down a little bit that way but they also dissipate energy by having to carry a load the load being the material that they erode from the bed and the banks and a stable healthy stable river is one that if you were to look over a long reach river the amount of sediment coming in equals roughly the amount of sediment going out, but it's not the same sediment. Some of it is eroded and carried, some of it's deposited and it balances out. So we have a balance of erosion and deposition within each long reach of channel. That rose of energy dissipates the, uh, the stream. About, uh, about over a hundred and some odd years ago, now about 130 years ago, a bunch of engineers, young engineers, started to throw apples into a river during high flow to figure out what type of acceleration they had during floods. And that lo and behold, when they started to clock how fast that apple was going over different distances, they discovered that it was flowing despite at a stable flow. It was not the flow down the channel because the, the reason there's a flow down the channel is because there's a gradient there. It wasn't accelerating. It was stable. 
the only way water could be going downhill and not increasing its velocity was it had to be doing work. In other words, work to slow itself down and dissipate its energy. And that's when they began to realize that rivers were doing some type of work. And later on, they discovered that work was er is erosion and deposition, which carries a load. And that erosion wor works in two vectors, horizontally and vertically. So a healthy river dissipates energy during those, those high flows vertically. And that horizontal uh, erosive pattern creates, if you look, can people see my pointer? Yep. If you look, a riffle pool sequence going down slope is a meander pattern, isn't it? You get erosion, deposition, erosion, deposition, erosion, deposition. When a river's in flood, it's rebuilding its riffle structure and it's redigging its pools. And for those of you that fished the river in late fall, early, early, early September, and all those point bars you stand on are well vegetated. There's lots of gravel, but there's lots of vegetation up there. You go back the following spring, there's no vegetation left on. It's all fresh gravel, but it's the same looking gravel. Years ago, a bunch of my friends used to paint rocks in those, in those point bars and discovered that every time there was a bankful flow, all the rocks moved to the next point bar downstream and were replaced by new rocks from upstream. In other words, a healthy, stable river rebuilds itself every time there's a big flow. So it creates those vertical meander patterns as, as a way of their deposition. The other aspect of deposition is horizontal uh, erosion. If you look here, this, I'm showing a meander pattern here. As a river goes across the channel down through a riffle, it has a relatively uniform velocity during uh, high flows across the cross section because it's, it's moving, all of it's moving at rough, roughly the same velocity. As it gets towards a bend that it's, cre it's created over time, the, the flow on the outside starts to come in this way flow, and meets the flow from coming on the inside and creates a corkscrew pattern around here until it gets to a straightaway where it dissipates and creates a uniform flow again to the next pool down below. That corkscrew pattern creates an enormous amount of additional energy. If the banks are really stable, it'll, it, the easiest place to find uh, sediment to, to move is, is, is the bottom and that creates a pool. As a, and that, because of the extra energy from that corkscrewing pattern from the confluence of the flow vectors, larger materials pulled off the bottom. As it comes around that side here and all of a sudden it goes straight again, it doesn't have that corkscrew pattern dissipates and creates more uniform flow. And the coarse material drops off, as an example here, to create a ripple crest. Or if I were to look back here, it erodes all this stuff. And then as it comes out to the back end to the glide, it has less velocity and it drops it out and builds a ripple crest. And then the finer material drops in until it gets to that concentrated point where it's coming in really, really hot now on, on, the, out on that bend again and starts to, to scour. And then the coarser material drops out to create the ripple crest of the next pool down below. And so on, and so on, and so on. And what they discovered, and those of you that like mathematics will be happy, is that there's a geometric relationships. There's with something called hydraulic geometry at work here. You can actually predict this, uh, the length uh, it takes for a sequence of riffles and pools to form in a channel if you know the cross-sectional area of bankful. With bankful cross-section and width and depth ratios, you can predict the riffle pool sequence. You can predict the meander pattern, the radius of curvature around bends. You can also protect, uh, predict the amplitude and wavelength. In other words, you can design a river. You can rebuild a healthy river from one that was damaged by uh, people doing other things. So this is what's exciting about uh, re restoration work is it's doable. It's not that the river can't do it itself, but in many cases, what they find is it only takes five to 10 years to really bugger up a river. And if you leave it alone without any further disturbances, it usually averages anywhere from 50 to 200 years to go back to a healthy, stable form. So devolution is fast, restoration naturally is slow. That's why we, we tend to nudge it with restoration work. So years ago, a bunch of people, there's about 40 different ways of classifying rivers in the world. 
uh, different geomorphologists and engineers have come up with one with, with a variety. The one that I like is one that Dave Roskin from Colorado uh, has put together. If you ever, if anybody is ever interested in looking at the stuff that Dave has done and reading some of his papers and his technical guide guidebooks, you just go to uh, a website called wildlandhydrology.com. I can send it off to Brian. He can post it later on, but it, it gives a lot of resources there. Anyway, uh, what, the reason we classify rivers is the reason why we have a dichotomous key for fish, so we know what species of animal we're dealing with. Under the similar conditions of valley slope, uh, general geology, and vegetative type, certain patterns of rivers occur everywhere in the world. The same types of patterns under the similar circumstances, which gives us a leg up in helping us to figure out what type of system we're dealing with and where we should be helping push it towards a healthy a uh, healthy, stable form again. These are the squiggle marks of, uh, of some of the classification, showing that under different types of slopes, you have uh, different types of channel forms and structures. The ones that are most common in the world are the seed channels, which are our traditional trout stream, riffle, pool uh, streams. We have the more, what I call the scoop ones, with the call, I'll show you examples of these. B-type channels are also what we call step pool systems that are found in higher gradients. E channels are the most interesting ones. They have the lowest width versus depth ratio. They're the ones you find in these wetlands in Northern Ontario that seem to snake everywhere across the landscape. And if you're in a canoe, you look like after two hours, you've hardly moved anywhere because you're going back and forth all over the damn place. And they're always deep or deeper and there's no riffles in them. So all of these patterns can be found in nature. So A channel form as an example, this is a A type channel form, highly constricted, gradient greater than 4%. It's a real series of steps and pools, very sharp steps, very sharp little pools. B type channels are like the pocket water you have on the credit upstream of the forks, where you get between there and cataract, where you got lots of very fast, because the gradient is so high, the river has to dissipate energy more quickly, and it does that by doing these bounces very, very quickly as it goes down the channel form. More energy, more dissipation is needed. That's where you, where you get these rivers that have lots of pocket water, we call it. These are other examples. This one from the, uh, the credit. This one is uh, the, the Willoughby Mock uh, upstream of, uh, Ro of um, Roscoe. And I could have shown examples from uh, BC and Alberta as well. There's lots out there, of course. And the other channel form is the one that were most common are the what, traditional trout streams like the beaver kill and the saugeen and the credit and the, a lot of part, parts of the credit. These long riffle pools, they have a little finer gradient, less than 1%. As a result, a little bit less energy, which means that the pattern of erosion deposition and meandering is stretched out. So you have a pool every four to five, four to, four to actually five to seven channel widths. So these things are characterized by relatively short pools and long, riffly, shallow sections with some run in it. And usually these areas have, uh, have a point bar with a floodplain on one side, cut bank on the other, and alternates as you go down the system. Very typical of feed type channels. Of course, these rivers are, can be large or small. Uh, that's the beaver kill there, large sea channel. And this is a beautiful little sea channel called Slough Creek in Yellowstone National Park. By the way, you can see where the river used to be. You can see it's old, me old meander scrolls because it's they're carrying groundwater because a lot of more, there's coarser gravels buried in there from decades and decades of uh, meander patterns being lost and changed over time. The E channels are really weird little systems. They're in very flat valleys with very low gradients and they meander a lot more and they have very low width to death ratio. Uh, the easiest way to describe an E, uh, C, an e channel, it's a, uh, it's a channel where you look and say, geez, that's only a couple of meters wide. It can't be that deep. And you step into it and you go up to your waist. That's an E channel. Uh, and there, then they can be both in clay bed systems where they quite often are really good nursery habitat for the pike, or they can be icy cold systems where there's lots of groundwater and then they become what we call our spring creeks. And the one in the, this picture here is the Sydenham River below Chatsworth. And it's a phenomenally productive system. A lot of Western uh, E channels as well. Uh, one on the left there um, is, um, uh, is, I think, um, it's not, not Sloop Creek. What's that? Which one is that? 
it's on it's um it's it's actually near Twin Bridges, uh, in Montana, and this one is uh, Temper Cooley Creek in uh, in um, in Wisconsin, but again, E type channels, very rich, very productive, some of the most productive uh, streams for trout anywhere in in the world. We also have other channel forms. The Grand between Ferguson and Laura is called an F channel. It wants to be a C channel, but it's going it's it's incised in bedrock, so it can't meander as much as it wants. So it's an imperfect C channel. Those are called F type channels. You can also have spring creeks that are C channels. This is um, Slu this is um, Poindexter uh, Creek or Armstrong Creek in Montana. This one down here is um, Trout Creek in uh, Minnesota, which is an icy cold. Bomb, uh, Spring Creek. Again, higher gradient, but lots of groundwater coming out of bedrock in those cases. So when we look at all these channel forms and that, and we're thinking about looking after them, what, what we have, we're, we also think about the animals themselves. And when we think about habitat, we, we talk about habitat use in rivers. There's three things that animals all need. They need healthy water with good water quality. They need sufficient quantity of water. Uh, the maximum productivity of any stream is based on the minimum flow in that stream because that's where the density dependency comes in. There's only so much habitat for only so many fish in a really in a stream when it's really, really low. That is ultimately the control of the total productivity of the stream. So as a lot of our streams are extracted from of water and we get lower and lower base flows, their total productivity goes down because there's not enough habitat during critical periods for sufficient numbers of fish. As in this one, this is really low flow here. Also, you've got uh, food. They need food of a variety of types. They need shelter from water current and predators. They need space. They need a variety of structures in the channel. Some, some want ripples and pools. Some want step pools. Some want sloughs. They also need you know, specific habitats for reproduction. For example, brook trout require groundwater discharge areas for reproduction. True salmon and trout don't. They utilize riffle hydraulics. Uh, the reason I call brook trout not a true trout is it's a char, right? It's a member of the char family. It's not a salmo or, or an oncorhynchus. So they require different habitat conditions. So when we think about channels, where do we find fish and how do they utilize them? For example, these are A and B type channels. Uh, uh, they're well used by trout and other species as well. Uh, in those cases, you're looking for uh, breaks in the current seams because no wild fish will survive by sitting in the heavy current and trying to feed. They may be in the heavy current, but they'll be behind a rock or in a pocket where there's virtually no velocity. And therefore they can watch the food conveyor belt go overhead and only pop up momentarily to grab something and go right back into the area where they want to, where they, where they can get away from the current because ultimately they have to eat more food than the energy they expend in capturing that food. And this is one of the reasons why heavily um, heavily managed hatchery fish don't do well when we put them in the wild in many cases, especially ones that haven't got any wild genes left in them, because they sit in the river in the main current expecting somebody to feed them all day, which happens in a hatchery, but not in the wild. So then quite often they don't survive that way. In the case of high gradient systems, some of the best places to look for trout are places like that. Someday I'll tell you about uh, my adventures with um, with um, with uh, one of Bill Phillips' uh, good buddies on the uh, Osable River. And the guy was 75 years old, was half blind, and still caught more big trout than any of us that were fishing the rivers any day of the week. And what he did was he went on to these super high gradient sections, looked for foam patches, crawled where he could sit on a rock not too far away, and used a tiny black fly and just dapped it on the white foam because the fish sat in, under the foam because of the super high water, all, the reason there's foam there is a current is pulling all that, the foamy stuff off and putting into them over here and being caught into that foam, which means all the bugs get caught in here. The fish sit under here, there's virtually no velocity. They look up to a white haze and any bug looks black. So it's easy to take and with, with this guy, it created a big pocket hole like this and a black, of black water and he'd strike and he'd have a really nice trout. Drove me crazy. Anyway, so here's a, that's a little tip for the next time you're going fishing in high gradient streams. But again, you look for the current breaks and pockets. Even in these large beat channels, the fish are quite often tight to the banks. My 
other example is fishing on the Madison River with um, Mike Jevons many years ago. And we were way down the stream working our way up. And we saw way upstream a guy working his way down. And we got, we sort of met him. Uh, the guy said, uh, how are you doing? We said, oh, pretty good. We've gotten a, some nice rainbows. And I said, well, how, where are you? Because we were wading in the river, wading up along the banks. And we said, how are you doing? He said, great. I got half a dozen browns. I said, we haven't caught any browns. We just got rainbow. And he said, well, good luck. And he kept on going. About 15 minutes later, he came walking back. He said, I kind of felt bad for you guys. So I just want to let you know, if you want to catch browns, stay out of the river. Because all the browns are against against the banks. So as soon as we got out of the river and started fishing the banks, we started catching brown trout. Interesting. So, sea channels, those, those more meandering, beautiful uh, pool rivers, that we, uh, uh, rivers, uh, sections of the river we like to fish, contain highly diverse habitat, probably more diversity of ha habitat types than any of the other channel forms. What you want to look for is large woody debris. Whether you're fishing smallmouth bass, northern pike, muscalunge, or trout, they all love wood debris. Not so much rainbows, but, uh, but rookies do too. Uh, they like wood debris. So you want to look at those edges. And what we find quite often is that trout will find wood debris that fits them like a glove. So the denser the wood debris, the happier the trout and the more trout that sit under those. Years ago when we used to do our electrofishing on the, grant, on the uh, credit, we estimated that every good log jam on the credit had at least 20 pounds worth of brown trout in them. And, and one, uh, one uh, I think uh, one log jam we did years ago, we found 54 brown trout in one big log jam on the credit, made up of about 30 fish under the side, under 12 inches, about 15 fish between 12 and 18 inches, and two fish over four pounds, all in the same log jam, but it was a really dense log jam. So interesting. So sea channels are quite good, especially for creating good habitat. Size does matter in small streams in that big fish and small streams are limited to large to small areas of deeper water. However, as the streams increase in size, fish will utilize those even uh, even it will even use the riffles. Each channels can hold lots of large numbers of fish, but they're very difficult to catch. That's why people get sort of fixated on Spring Creek fishing is because the, the weeds are like soft rocks. They create obstructions and, and holding lies for the fish, but they create multiple very comp complex currents and very difficult to fish. So they're, they're, but they're very productive systems. And again, as, as I mentioned here, don't, when you're, if you're fishing, don't neglect the margins early in the morning. Um, this is a section standing on the bridge at, um, on the um, Willowy Mock near the uh, Darby's old house. And um, that's a nice about 17 inch brown trail sitting about, uh, uh, about uh, two meters off the bank in not too deep of water. We watched a bunch of guys come to go fishing. They stopped their cars, threw their waiter, waders on them, waded straight out into the stream and scared all those fish away. So, Many cases, especially with these larger streams, you don't let, neglect the margins, especially first thing in the morning. One of the things we find, even with medium, like where th this section of the Madison River is where you start getting the pocket water moves in, is still very abundant. And even there, you have deep pockets. So this, here, this is an area of the Madison River around Slide Inn that on average, the deepest you'll, you'll see is multiple channels, like five or six channels in this section. And the deepest water is maybe head over your knees in depth. Most of it is around your ankles deep. But wherever there's a pocket that's a little bit deeper than the riffle, and uh, the, the, it creates a, a holding line for these fish. And most of the guys we saw wade right through this water to go look at the deeper pools downstream. And what we found was by fishing the pockets, because that's where habitat also exists, where they can the, uh, they can uh, feed very easily. Riffles are great for uh, food production, but fish don't sit in them because if there's no have no no structure to protect them from the current, they'll wait in the pool or the uh, the bottom end of the riffle for the food. However, if the river is big enough and has deep enough little pockets in it, they'll sit in the riffle in those pockets. And then if you fish those pockets, you can catch half decent fish. This is a picture of the the Mike of a lovely fish that Mike Jevons caught years ago fishing that shallow water one afternoon with the dry fly. 
So we have these beautiful rivers, but what are we doing with them? So my first question is where we, have we come from? Now I started working in government uh, 1979, no, actually 78, because I worked for uh, Environment Canada for a couple of years, for a year and a half. I started working for the Ministry of Natural Resources in 79, which was the beginning of the golden age of uh, fisheries management in, uh, in Ontario because we were moving out of what we call the sector-based management. I call it the cutting of the trees, the drawing of the water, the stocking of the fish, and the catching of the poachers. That was all that government did up until that, until through the 60s, 70s. And then in the 70s, mid-70s, they had a couple of scientists that ended up being directors of fisheries. Uh, Ken Loftus was specifically one of them. And he said, we need better science need to move towards a system-based approach to the management of fisheries because these waters, lakes, and rivers are systems. There are large systems we have to look at a broader scale, and they created a document based on the best information from federal and provincial scientists called the Strategic Plan for Ontario Fisheries, or SPOF. It promoted a science-based approach, and the focus was on the whole system, lakes, lake basins, and watersheds. And to paraphrase uh, Bill Clinton, it's habitat, stupid. That's what they realized. It was habitat was the issue that we needed to deal with. And we rationalized down the hatchery program in Ontario because we said what the hatcheries really need, we need them to supplemental stock in areas where we can't get natural reproduction anymore, create some fisheries, but really we should be putting more money into habitat and stewardship. That was the beginning of the Community Fisheries Involvement Program and later on the Community Fish and Wildlife Improvement Program and the Stewardship Programs because we said that good sound management starts with stewardship, not with regulations. Regulation is your last recourse in sound environmental management. Unfortunately now, governments are so downsized and ministries and natural resources and environment, the only tool they have left is regulation. And as any senior policy <laughs> person will tell you, Regulation is your last recourse. Stewardship is your first, and we've lost all that. So management focus was then, again, still on uniformity. I can still have, remember having this argument with Ken Loft this umpteen years ago, saying, he said, we have to manage so everything is consistent and the same. I said, but some rivers and lakes are more productive than others. Shouldn't we be managing them for excellence rather than for mediocrity? He didn't like that. And I still stand by that. I think we manage for mediocrity and we need to manage better. And wherever a bunch of us have established special angling regulations because of high quality water, we've been rewarded with high quality fisheries. So go figure. So what, are, what do we need for the long term? What have we discovered over the last 30, 40 years of fisheries management and resource management in Canada? And that, first of all, 40 years of work has confirmed that SPOP was bang on. It's the right way to go. Habitat is the ultimate way we should be going. Number one priority, habitat management and restoration is the, is the most sustainable approach at the lowest cost to society. We needed a better context. Stream is not necessarily the context. The watershed or the catchment is the context. The lake basin is the context, not that little section of stream. We need context to understand the whole system. We're, and that's why we've been fighting tooth and nail for governments to reestablish the watershed planning process in Ontario. A friend of mine from University of Wisconsin-Madison uh, invited me down to lecture many years ago. He was a professor of planning at the University of Wisconsin-Madison, Steve Bourne. And Steve started, um, introduced me and said, Ontario's got it made compared to the, uh, to, to, uh, the United States. He said, first of all, they're managing, managing on a watershed basis in Ontario. Second of all, they have conservation authorities based on a watershed, partially funded by municipalities and partially funded by the province. And they're doing watershed planning and implementing it through official plans. Ontario has it made. They've done it. And systematically in the last 20 years, we've wiped that all out. So there you go, guys. Anyway, we know what we need to do. We're just tending to forget or letting politicians forget. The other thing we found is a wild, naturally reproducing fish are the healthiest, strongest, and most resilient 
to change and adjustment in channels, especially with this era of climate change. We need the wildest, strongest animals, and that means wild fish that are naturally produced. Hatcheries can fill a gap that have proven to be costly, non-sustainable, and lead to inferior fish with poor genetics. They give the best genetics they can. In Ontario, we try to go back to the wild every once in a while to refresh our, our hatchery stock, but even then it's a sad, sad secondary thing to wild fish. When I talked to our, our provincial geneticist a number of years ago about reestablishing brook trout in Mill Creek down in Tequonia, I said, well, the local m &R said that we should just stock with brook trout. He sa I sa and I said to him, I want to go to a wild population of brookies and transfer brook trout. He said, do that. Don't put the hatchery fish in. It's not going to work. That's the, that's the provincial geneticist for m &R. So wild fish, not hatchery. The other thing is in the long term, the least costly, most sustainable solution is protect the best and restore the rest. That's what we have to do. We have to restore or rehabilitate our natural, what I call the natural infrastructure. Those watersheds with the type of geology they have, the land cover they have, the soil structure they have, the, the, the vegetation they have on them, their, their pattern, their forms, that's part of our natural infrastructure. That's what provides us with our drinking water sources. It provides, it moderates flooding if we manage them well. It creates opportunities, creates product, productive systems for both for our food production as well as for wildlife. It improves our air quality and it improves our quality of life. So we need to start to not only protect the highest quality examples of healthy environment, but restore the rest of it where the, most of us live and adjacent to where most of us live. Again, a side benefit is clean water, clean air, and wholesome food. Right? <laughs> it's like motherhood and apple pie. And again, Clean water and wholesome food come from a healthy, functional landscape. And we're not allowing that to happen. Right now, we're seeing development in highly sensitive areas right across Canada. We're, we're looking at re putting in development again in the Green Belt and on the Oak Ridge Moraine when we know that those are the source areas for the water supply for millions of people in Ontario. In Alberta, they're, they're opening up coal mining on the foothills of the Rocky Mountains, which is the water supply for virtually all of Alberta. So you got to shake your head sometime. And again, ultimately, healthy environments sustain our spirit of well-being, especially now that we do this COVID issue. People are desperate for green areas and green space. They're desperate for it. And what are we doing? Building lots more places for people to live but not more protecting and restoring more green space to keep their souls healthy as well. Ultimately, doing this is at a far lower cost for us, our kids and our grandkids, and it does not have to be against economic development. By the way, development does not mean growth. Development means improvement and capability. Sometimes it means growth, but not always. Look up the definition. You know, politicians you know, use the term development to mean growth, and we don't necessarily need growth to have good development. So where are we going? Well, downsize is one of the things. In the last 20 years, it used to be, hi, I'm from the government. I'm here to help you now. It's sorry. <laughs> we can't help you. Can you help us? So for a while, their government was coming to us and saying, hey, guys, can you be more stewards? We're losing all our, our boots on the ground, but you guys can do it. And we did. You know, Isaac Walton Club, Trout Limited, all the local OFEH associates were very, very active in conservation and restoration, but then government further downsized and lost their stewardship program. Less staff, less resources. Ministries lost the boots on the ground to do stewardship. Their only recourse left was regulation. Less effective and ultimately leads to further degradation because no matter how good you are with regulating a development, you'll always have slippage. And without doing restoration elsewhere to offset that, the overall system declined. We then lost support of our stewardship program. CEPWIP went by the wayside. Stewardship councils went by the wayside. Even the partnership coordinators to replace the stewardship councils have now gone by the wayside. We're getting to a point where we need to, to, to give our politicians of all stripes a smack across the side of the head and say, guys, we all live here. We need to work better and more and, and smarter again because we're, we're moving towards the bottom line when the bottom line will end us at the bottom of the hole. 
So we need to start smartening up here. Again, we need, we're further striking and neutering the last line of defense. Conservation authorities have been picking up all the pieces that were left by, um, by m &R when it devolved and MOE when it's devolved. And they were trying through some of their programs to offset some of that. But now after bill, uh, bill 229 and section, uh, section uh, schedule six has been passed the last week or the week before, now they will be less effective. The last line of defense is now there. So we have deregulation is now because they think that deregulation will give us an economic growth. It will in the short term, and then it'll cost us one H of a lot in the long term. And that's why we created conservation authorities in the 40s and 50s, because we realized that we'd screwed up. And what are we doing? <laughs> We're moving back to the 40s and 50s in our thinking. So we need to think smarter again. And as I said, we need to start telling our elected officials, and I don't care who they are, because the liberals didn't do that much better. They did a little bit better when it came to environment uh, than the conservatives. But some of the best uh, some of the best legislation we had was under a conservative government under Bill Davis. Where do those guys go? It's not the same type of PC that we have now. So we need to change that. So stewardship is even more important now. We need to reawaken the stewardship and on the ground actions as practiced in the 80s and 90s. We need to get more involved. And I'm really pleased that you guys are thinking that you need to step up and give a little bit of a hand because we desperately need to demonstrate that we're willing to do the work. At the same time, we need to involve our kids, get them to understand, see, and feel the value of our healthy rivers, streams, and lakes, because ultimately they're going to inherit that. If they inherit, and if they inherit the crappier habitat, you know who they're going to blame. We also need to support and join NGOs that are working on the ground, which means we need to really help everybody that's trying to get the work done. And we need to tell government that you demand a healthier environment and get back to working to make it better. Finally, not only is protection important, and this is my argument with a lot of great groups, and I'm, I'm not dissing on them, great groups like Nature Conservancy and a lot of these other folks that are like CPAWs that want to protect critical areas. I think that's really important. They're great examples. But that means the government lets government off the hook. That means that all our settled landscapes where we practice agriculture and rural development and so on is up for grabs. Well, no. We should be managing those areas as best as we can, given the constraints of our other uses. But we're not doing that right now. So we need, as I said, to protect the best and try to restore as much of the function of the rest. They're both achievable. So let's look at some of the examples of things where we have fixed things up. This is a little stream rehab project on Belgrave Creek on the Maitland watershed, just showing an example from 79 through 80, 81 to 2001. The this, this difference between here and here was one year. The difference between here and here was a second year. And this is what it looked like 20 years later. We went from only able to find one fish, one little trout in about 100, 200 meters of stream to this point where we were finding one trout per square meter. And that was in two years. Rivers have an amazing ability to heal themselves if we push them in the direction that they want to go. And that gets into the stream type and stream form. If we push them to the stream form that that landscape wants to see there, the river will heal itself further and become more productive. Here's some other examples of some of the works that have been done. This is a, an old mill dam that was partially blocking uh, fish migration still. This is uh, uh, on the lower end of Whiteman's Creek at um, Five Oaks. We took this dam out. This is the day after the dam was removed. This is one year later. This is five years later. You wouldn't even know there was a dam there. And now fish have easy access up and down Whiteman's Creek. As a result of that, probably explains the explosion of uh, <laughs> rainbow trout in Whiteman's Creek over the last uh, 30 years or so. There's another little system that we dealt with. Uh, for anybody that's uh, driven through Guelph, headed north towards Fergus on Highway 6, you, you went past uh, the Ignatius Jesuit Center and the two ponds on the other side of, uh, of Highway 6. We took it out. And within a year, it started to regrow. So if we looked at the pond, this is looking towards Highway 6. There's the causeway for Highway 6. 
The year after we took it out, it looked like this. And five years later, it looked like this. And we now have trout going from the headwaters of that little Martin Creek all the way down to the Speed River. The dam that we removed had been, a, there had been a dam for 186 years in that location, eliminating the ability of brook trout to move to big water to overwinter. Now they can, and they are. Here's another old project we did on um, in Brawny Creek in Lowville Park. You can see the channel is extremely wide. Uh, my comment about the description of, uh, of, uh, of Lowville Park in midsummer during low flow was, uh, it looked like a gravel pit with a bit of water flowing around the rocks. We went in there and we started to do, we fixed up the channel, we narrowed the channel up to the point where we started to see trout coming back. Over wide channels, loved to death by people that like to build rock weirs. Started building riffle, uh, riffle structures, rebuild riffle pool sequence and let the river then start to heal itself. We took, we took banks like this, sculpted them and then just planted the hell out of them so that Five years later, they looked like this. This is all habitat restoration work. We let the river heal itself. So what were the results on that Bronte Creek? That was 1.1 kilometer section of restoration work we did. It cost close to a million dollars over the, over, the, over the years. We monitored for three years pre and five years post. We had channel narrowing between 30 to 60%. Repairing vegetation, we put 6,300 plants well, in that riparian zone. The songbirds started coming back. We had the American eel have come back. The salmon population has increased dramatically. And for two separate years, we've caught both young of the year and yearling brook trout, the first that were recorded there in 55 years. And the temperatures started to moderate. We even found mud puppies, little salamanders that were now utilizing that stream that we hadn't utilized it before in that section. So it can work. A little bit of money. It was a long way to doing some restoration work. Here's a project that we've done up in Markdale on a couple of cold water trips. This again was old beaver activity, all, old log jam, and a lot of old uh, undersized culverts and crossings. It basically, it filled in and it graded over the years and widened itself out, narrowed it. We took the wood debris out, we put it on the banks, we tried to rebuild the riffle pool sequence and let the river heal itself. And four years after, we first of all, when the river looked like this, we had tried electrofishing and you sink up to your waist in, it's a technical term, oh, loon shit, uh, with maybe about four to five inches of water and the rest, and then the rest of it was, you're standing on muck. And somewhere way down there, you felt rock. So we did the restoration work, the channel cut itself down, narrowed itself. We couldn't even find a brook shot to save our lives, although we think that we saw a few well, before we did the work. And two years later, it looked like this. Here's an example from three years after the work. We did, we just did the restoration work and we just watched it one day. This is the one pool that I just showed. A few fish swimming around. Yep. These are all brook trout. But look at the weed. That is so impressive, Jack. You know, I, I've not been doing this for 40 years. I still am surprised <laughs> when things work out well. And this one worked out very well. And again, we did, we did all we did was rebuild the habitat. We knew that there was a few fish there and the fish did the rest. So here's the bottom line, guys. This is a comment that I, I don't know if anybody ever met Walt Crawford. Walt was a real firebrand with, uh, with Trout Limited. Um, he was the president of the, of the old uh, Grand River chapter of Trout Limited many years ago. 
and he was the instigator for the Grand River Fish Plan as well. We were sitting around a table with during the Grand River Fish Planning meeting, and Walt was the volunteer person from uh, the angling organizations or conservation organizations. He looked at us government guys and he said, guys, I just want to let you know it's not your resource. It's our resource. It's those of us that live here. You, the agencies, are here to help us manage it. But ultimately, it's our responsibility. But agencies, you better damn well have our back. I don't think this government has our back. And they better be told they don't have our back. And uh, Walt would be very pleased if we went, because he was a, a very active, staunch PC supporter. And I think he would be very disappointed right now seeing what's going on. So, and in the end, what can we do? You can't protect your fisheries and fish with an app. All these young guys and gals out there, I mean, everybody thinks that the app, uh, the, uh, there's applications for their iPhones. It'll be incredible. They'll solve all these problems, but much of the work, an app can help with your calculations and analysis, but ultimately restoration work means getting your hands dirty, getting, uh, getting people involved and on the ground. So you can't protect your fisheries with, uh, and fish with an app. You have to stop the government retreat from protecting the health of our watersheds, rivers, and streams and get them to be champions again. But we also need to step up as stewards and, and uh, local volunteers. We need the boots on the ground, we have to tell them that, that they stop giving us these damn sugar pills. Yes, it creates great uh, economic development in the big river and uh, big lakes like the, uh, the Great Lakes, but ultimately vast majority of the fish that we catch in our Great Lakes, especially not Lake Ontario, but even Lake Erie, Georgian Bay, Lake Huron, the vast majority of those fish are wild fish now. We don't have to stop them. Perhaps we do in Lake Ontario, but even in Lake Ontario rivers, we're finding that 15 to 20, well, actually up to 20% of the Chinook and coho being caught in Lake Ontario are wild fish reproducing. All the fish on the Grand, except for maybe escapees from, uh, from uh, the U.S., are wild fish. The Grand is a hell of a steelhead fishery. Those are wild fish. So hatcheries have their use, but they're not for everything. They're a sugar pill to a large degree. Again, it's not, our, it's not their resource, it's ours. We need to demand sound policy. Trouble is that everybody's so darn busy now with the worries about, and legitimately so for this pandemic, that I can remember John Snowblin during Mr. Harris's time saying out loud that sometimes you had to create a crisis in order to get what you wanted done, done. Well, this time the politicians didn't have to create a crisis, a crisis came, but they're getting things done under the cover of what's going on and everybody's focused on something else. They're letting things slide underneath. And the worst the thing I said to, um, <laughs> to Brian, the two things I heard um, um, from Walkerton, well, the one major thing was, A, I thought somebody else was doing that, which was the worst of it. Uh, and <laughs> And for walking as well, we, and another great quote was, we now know that those things that we cannot see, smell, or taste can hurt us. It's sort of wonderful basic science in, in grade school and high school. But anyway, that was, that was during walking. In. But right now, I quite often say, where's government? Where are they? Where are they should be doing something? And you say, but pardon me, but where were you when the budgets for all these agencies were cut? m and and MOE's budgets now in total make up less than one half of 1% of the provincial budget. Less than one half of 1% of the provincial budget. That's one of the reasons you get rid of the environmental commissioner. They kept on telling the government that. And they, the government didn't want the environmental commissioner telling the public that they're really getting rid of all this stuff. Nobody told me that that was happening. Well, they were, but... Most people aren't listening because they're busy doing other things and worried about other things. And in many cases, legitimately so. But we don't, shouldn't have to be keeping an eagle eye on our governments all the time. But maybe in the last 10, 15 years, we should have. So we need government to step up a bit more than they have in the past. Ultimately, the cheapest way to let the fish is to let the fish do it themselves by ensuring that the rivers, lakes, and streams are healthy and the landscapes are healthier than they are right now. 
especially in settled landscapes like we live right here. And to paraphrase the great American, ask not what your river can do for you, but ask what you can do for your river. Get involved. Put something back. Because that I, I grew up, um, my dad always told me, if you like hunting and fishing, you better damn well put something back to, to support what you're doing. And I think it's time for all of us to make sure that we're putting back and we get our kids and grandkids knowing that they need to put something back too if for the things they enjoy. Because ultimately, the fisheries and the fishing is in our collective hand. Thanks very much, guys.